Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I had so many different ways, of course, that I wanted to start again today because, as I said in the first lecture, I never know where to start um, generally with this sort of thing. But I just learned um, that I've been introduced to Ollie, and so I had no idea that that was how you referred to this wonderful um, experience. And so thank you so much for having me back at Ollie. I do appreciate being here for the second time. Um, and as, as, as I do, I learn something new every day. Yes, ma'am. And, and we, we can in a moment, and I will, I will do that because I'm going to make very little use of the slides. Um, and I have perhaps a short snippet of something to show you, and maybe something longer, um, but it depends on how I get on and the kinds of questions I get asked, et cetera, et cetera. So I will be very mindful of the fact that you and I both can't see that, um, because I certainly can't. Um, um, yeah, yeah, we'll turn, we'll turn the lights off when we get to, yeah, that point, that point. Um, I perhaps was going to talk about the wonderful autumnal morning and the beautiful blue sky, um, but then I thought, well, um, I might talk about where are we going, and even that proved challenging for me um, to, to address that question, which I do want to address in a short moment. But then I thought, well, why not start where I left off, which, which seems to make the most sense. Um, and so I will start where I left off with, with, with Asim Bonanga, which was that film, that short snippet of Johnny Clegg that I showed. And I felt that I might want to give you just a little bit of context there, because I showed the film without talking necessarily about it. Um, and so, in order to help me get started, if you don't mind, I'll start there, and then I'm sure I'll flow into, into the lecture. So, Asimbo Nanga means, um, where is he? It's a Zulu term, Asimbo Nanga, where is he? And that song was penned by Johnny Clegg, and in fact, I might have even put the lyrics up somewhere and have possibly lost them now. Um, there you go. I copied them over. Um, and, and, and the song really is about where is he? Now where is who? Not only Nelson Mandela. So the song was also about Steve Bantubiko. It was about Victoria Mtenge. It was about N uh, uh, Nigel a uh, Agate or Neil Agate. Um, and in essence, it was a symbolic song about folk who had been taken out of society, either jailed, incarcerated, or murdered, or simply weren't there. So singing that song during the struggle about Mandela and others really was a reflection on the nature of um, the world that, that we lived in at the time. And so it was particularly symbolic. And remember I spoke about Mandela's use of symbolism. It was particularly symbolic, poignantly symbolic, for Mandela to turn up on that stage in that way with those lyrics playing. He was a master at the, at the use of symbolism. And so he turned up, and if you noticed, it wasn't that choreographed. You know, Johnny Clegg was saying, do you want to say something? Would you like to? And he fumbled a bit with the microphone. It was literally about him appearing, him actually being able to appear. And so when, when Mandela passed, that song became very popular in South Africa, as I might have, might have mentioned um, last time round. This question of where, where are they, where is he? Um, and so those lyrics are pretty um, powerful and were sung a lot during, during the time of apartheid. It um, wasn't the only struggle song, but of course, one of them. So thank you for letting me make a start in that way. Um, I think the second thing that I want to say is that um, I have had the misfortune once or twice, and perhaps you will share in this misfortune, I hope not, but perhaps you will, um, of stepping on chewing gum. And, and, and if it's a warm day, the chewing gum is particularly sticky, and it, it sticks to your shoe, and you might, you know, it might be a nice shoe, um, and, and you try to get rid of it, and you try to clean it off and stuff, 
And so it is with the context that I described in the last lecture. We can't shake that context off. It's going to continue to stick with us as we continue with these lectures. And as you've invited me to end on a diagnostic and prognostic type of um, lecture in relation to South Africa and where we're going, even there, this pernicious chewing gum, which is the context, sticks with us. So don't expect us to get rid of that chewing gum that's stuck now, that's stuck to our shoe and follows us on our journey as it, as it, as it does. Unfortunately, and I, I think you can get rid of chewing gum, you, you, the struggle to get rid of the context is a little, is a little um, stronger. I am going to not talk about Nelson Mandela's youth. So he grew up in the, what we call the Transkei, uh, in, in a village called Klunu. Um, beautiful area. Those of you who've seen the film will recognize some of those wonderfully undulating green hills across and down to, the, to the, what we call the Wild Coast. Many of us think of that part of South Africa as rivaling in beauty to the Western Cape. Um, and I think if you've been there, you might, you might just agree with me that it is breathtakingly beautiful. Um, I'm not going to dwell on his youth. Um, and of course, it's contained in the, in the biography. Um, the other thing I'm going to say by way of starting is perhaps more cryptic. And I hope you will forgive me for being more cryptic because I've given these, these lectures some thought. And I think I have six of them, which is a nice even number. A sort of, there's a symmetry in that. Um, not that I'm always mad about symmetry. I kind of like stochasm and uncertainty and things like that too. But if you imagine these six lectures with a fulcrum in the middle and you see a sort of middle point, then I'm hoping to take you to a place as I begin to talk and continue to talk about Mandela, where we at least to some extent place ourselves in his shoes in relation to a huge question which he had to find an answer for. And it is in this way, this sort of teleological way, this idea of me heading somewhere to a midpoint and then us together perhaps reflecting on this question that I hope to get to in sort of, if not next Wednesday, definitely the Wednesday, the Wednesday after. So on that cryptic note and with those strange com comments by way of start, um, I really, as a political scientist, am interested in M Mandela's politicization. And I want to talk then about his politicization and the factors that shaped and influenced him. Um, and I will start gently with some factors today, some things that shaped his political thinking, and perhaps launch more fully into those and some of the more um, profound aspects of apartheid in the next lecture, although if we have time, we'll get there today. There was a particular person called Gawa Khadebe who introduced Nelson Mandela to politics. And he introduced N Nelson Mandela to politics in a particularly influential way through a bus boycott, which he had been um, orchestrating at the time. Um, and so Nelson Mandela, if you like, at the early age of around 25, was introduced to uh, mass mobilization politics through this bus bo boycott by a friend of his called Gawa Radebe. But if we think about, about Mandela's politicization, there's, 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 a, there's another aspect which, so besides the practical aspect of politics on the street, which influenced Nelson Mandela, and this was the very formation of the African National Congress um, in 1912. And so the African National Congress was formed by a lawyer, Pixley Kaseme, in 1912. And it was formed as a direct response to one of the many legacies that the British left behind for us. Yeah, those pesky British. <laughs> and you know them too here, don't you? <laughs> and, and your presidents always remind their prime ministers, don't they? Um, yeah. Um, I think when Cameron came over, President Obama reminded him too, um, and so forth. Um, 
So, so they left the Union of South Africa for us, and that union, that political settlement that the British left for us, of course left out black folk. And so in Pixley Kaseme's words, and this is on page 39 of the, of the biography, um, the union left black South Africans with a political settlement in which we have no voice in the making of laws and no part, and that's a quote, no part in the administration. So in, in, in many senses, the African National Congress formed as a result of British colonialism and as a result of the settlement, the Union, known as the Union of, of, of South Africa in 1910. But it wasn't the formation of the ANC per se that influenced Mandela as much as the fact that it was moribund, as much as the fact that it was supplicatory in nature, as much as it was the fact that it was black folk with hat in hand bowing before white masters and asking gently if they might consider making some small changes to um, these things that were bothering them. And so it was this, this attitude of the ANC and the, and the leadership of the ANC which, which, irked, which irked Mandela. And, and even as late as 1940, when the African National Congress got a new president, President Zuma, so A B Kluma, not related to the Zuma, the current Zuma, a different Zuma, different pronunciation, X U M A. Um, he began to breathe some organizational life into the ANC. He brought some money to the ANC and organized it in terms of um, um, branches and so forth. But even then, even in 1940, um, there was a tension that began to emerge between the generations. And this tension was of the older generation with this particular attitude towards the white so-called master and, 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 and this, this lack of, of movement. Um, and a leadership of the African National Congress that was indeed then in dread of what they called the demagoguery and the militancy of this emerging younger cadre of folk. Now, you would be right in saying that Mandela was one of these emerging, young, challenging leaders. He wasn't the only one. There were others. And one that was significant, and perhaps that we forget in terms of significance, along with Stephen Bantu Biko, was a man by the name of Anton Lembede. And so Mandela and Lembede and a few other young folk um, began to have conversations about this this lack of action and what that meant for change in South Africa. And in many respects, Anton Lembede is the father of a thing called black consciousness in, in, in South Africa. Um, never really a political movement, never really a political party with an ideology, much more uh, a way of thinking and a way of feeling. And I might reflect more on black consciousness in a, in, a, in a subsequent lecture. But at this point, I'm simply saying that, that Mandela met Lembede, and Mandela and Lembede had, had lots of conversations about the central thrust of an argument, which was that black folk needed to mobilize themselves as black folk and should not and could not and needed not to rely on white folk to be part of that struggle. In fact, to talk about it in racist terms, the way the South Africans still do talk about it, it was Lembede's view and Mandela's view that the struggle ought to be waged without recourse to black, sorry, to white, colored, or Indian support. It was also an argument which saw at its heart the British as systematically working to discourage and break down and ultimately eradicate all nationalistic tendencies towards what they termed their alien subjects. And of course, I, I, I should mention that you have parallels here in your country which you know better about than me, parallels with folks such as Marcus Garvey, and a person whose name, whose surname I always mispronounce. It's a bit like St. Louis, I say St. Louis. Um, but then again, I say tomato and you say tomato. <laughs> um, 
And my son says that too. I say banana, and he says, no, Dad, it's banana. Um, <laughs> so I get it. So W-E-B Du Bois. I, I would have said Dubois, um, but we know who we're talking about. So there was a small band of youth, including Walter Sisulu, by the way, who languished in jail with Mandela all those years, um, and, and Lembede and others who were talking about um, this idea of, of black consciousness and the role of the youth, and then um, wanting to form a youth structure within the African National Congress. Sorry about that. I know I've changed it. That's my awfully messy um, desktop. Um, now, another factor that shaped that shaped Mandela as a, as a human being and shaped the African National Congress and began to play into this idea of black consciousness and black folk going it alone was this phenomenon, was this experience um, known as the Second World War. And in fact, a particular aspect of the Second World War, which was the, was the Atlantic Charter. Some of you may remember the signing of the Atlantic Charter, which was signed by Churchill and Roosevelt in 1941. And the aspect of the charter that resonated so strongly with black people in South Africa and with these young folk in particular was this sentence in that charter which said that it committed the signatories um, to respect the rights of all people to choose the form of government under which they will live. And when Mandela and Limbede and Sisulu and others read this, they were saying, well, that's exactly right. It didn't take long for Churchill, by the way, to back away from that statement and, and provide some context for what that charter meant. And of course, so I have a quote, you know, he, on page 41 of the biography, he didn't mean the peoples to include, for argument's sake, the natives of Nigeria or East Africa. Heaven forbid he didn't think about the Arabs, he didn't in include the Arabs who might expel the Jews from Palestine. That's perhaps a little more controversial, um, but it's a quote from the book. The point is he was accepting, he was making exceptions. The African National Congress would have none of that. It set up a committee to look into the charter and it produced a document titled Africans Claims in South Africa. And this document at that time reasserted the right of all peoples, all peoples to choose their government and indeed challenged the world to say that the acid test for the charter was its implementation on the African continent. Mandela was around 25 years old at this point, and he was by now committed to ANC politics. He began to feel its pull through some of these factors. Um, and he then, and, and Radebe, and Sisulu, and others, decided to present the idea of the formation of an African Cong National Congress Youth League, ANCYL, um, formally to the, to the ANC um, um, president, Dr. Zuma. And so the Youth League, and it's important to think about the Youth League because of its impact across the decades right until even the present, uh, the present um, um, was formally launched in 1944 with Mandela on the executive board, led by the, the black, um, so, so, so the, the black consciousness African nationalist Anton Lembede. Now, I wanted to quote from Lembede, and this quote I take from page 42 of this book, um, because when I get to the sixth the, the ultimate lecture in this series, I want to come back to this quote in the context of change in South Africa. And so Lembede at this time, when he was talking about the formation of the Youth League, was talking about the description between the differences that existed between black and white perceptions. And I just want to quote it. The white man regards the universe as a gigantic machine hurtling through time and space to its final destruction. Individuals in it 
are but tiny organisms with private lives that lead to private deaths. The African, on his side, regards the universe as one composite whole, an organic entity progressively driving towards greater harmony and unity, whose individual parts exist merely as independent aspects of one whole. And so that was the thinking at the time um, with Lembede and Mandela and Sisulu, if you want to cap wanted to capture it in a particular way, um, was that difference on the one hand and this driving African nationalism, which was saying, we black folk need to do it on our own. Now, this was then the birth of, of Mandela's African nationalism and his exposure to black consciousness and his emerging um, political thinking, if you like, about directions in which he might go and directions in which he might take the African National Congress and directions in which South Africa might head. But insofar as it was an emerging idea, it was also an idea which at this time didn't have a clearly defined set of policy implications, certainly not practically spelt out. And if you like, the, the practicalities of policy, which continue to be, in, in fact, reflected by the polls I'm about to discuss, this, the, the policy implications were starkly articulated by saying one of the following two things. Is the policy that, at that point, the struggle should be aimed at driving the white man into the sea and getting rid of the white man from, if not the African continent, then certainly this, the this South Africa. And on the other hand, um, as de facto then became the case, and we shall see how this, how this early thinking changed over time, um, did it mean that other racial groups were here to stay and that what ultimately was sought was the eradication of white supremacy. And so you had these two sort of um, um, thoughts emerging and associated with them different practical um, um, programs of, of action. Now, I do want to put myself on pause. And actually, maybe I'll say two things, not one, but I can't say them simultaneously. <laughs> the one is, um, oh man, you know, I can think of so many things, so, so as can you. Um, um, so the one is, is um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions at any particular point, so please, you know, if you have a question, just stop me and, and simply ask, um, I'm happy for that. Um, but m more importantly, this question of black consciousness um, if we just look back through history, disappears as we see the one side of the equation gaining traction, the, the multiracial idea as espoused in the Freedom Charter, which is where we're heading. Um, but of course, it comes back in the mid-70s with Stephen Bantu Biko and the importance of black consciousness um, in mobilizing young people in 1976 in what became known as the 76, the Soweto 76 riots which you also see, for example, in the film about Mandela, um, the driving force in relation to black consciousness and the importance of black consciousness and the current resurgence in South Africa of black consciousness now in 2015 um, and, and, and why it's important. These are, these are things that I perhaps hope to reflect on when we get to 76 and then when we get to the last lecture in relation to um, uh, transition in, in South Africa. But I do want to say that Lembede was the father of black consciousness and Stephen Bantu Biko picked up on a lot of those ideas in the mid 70s, um, ideas which were to mobilize the youth. And in fact, when we talk about seminal moments in history, then 1976 is the time that we can discern where it was then impossible for the Afrikaner regime to continue moving forward in quite the way that 
that it had up to then. That was the death blow of apartheid. From then we talk about the decline of apartheid and the rise of the liberation movements. Prior to 76, we talk about the rise of the Afrikaner and the decline of the liberation movements. That's kind of giving you a sense of how important 76 was and a bit of the role of black consciousness. Um, why did black consciousness resonate so much with, with black folk? Well, because, because at its heart, of, uh, apartheid was about, about um, removing dignity. Apartheid wasn't so much about anything else than it was about breaking people down so that they felt they had no dignity, they had no self-worth, they had no self-esteem, they felt as if they were sub-human beings. And for a lot of folk, they began to believe that, most folk. And certainly, if you think about the African National Congress's style of lobbying towards the white boss, the white master, it's, it's demonstrated in that. And, and with black consciousness, which is why it resonated so strongly with Mandela and then resonated with the youth in 76, people began to feel like they were human beings, that they had self-worth, that they, it was okay to be black and that they were human and could be human. And so this, this, this idea was hugely important in enabling someone who might feel that they couldn't turn up here or stand in front of you and talk to reclaim that sense of self-worth and confidence and be able to do that. Um, and so I've gone on a tangent, but I feel that's okay. What were some of the other factors that shaped um, Mandela um, to be the, the person he was? Um, so certainly the fact that the African National Congress was no effective opposition was a key factor. Mandela could not, did not like that at all. The government, the English government prior to 1948, so in 1946, cracked down ruthlessly on a strike on the mines in, uh, on the Witwatersrand just outside Johannesburg um, and, and blamed communism in particular for the cause of that strike and, 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 and uh, uh, murdered many in, uh, uh, strikers. Um, and this upset Mandela um, at that time in, in 46. The passing by that same English government prior to 1948 um, of a thing known as the Indian Ghetto Act, which prevented Indians then prior to 48 from owning more land. It was felt that the Indians, because they were astute business folk, um, were, a ch were a challenge and a threat to white folk, passed this act. This infuriated, this upset Nelson, Nelson Mandela. Um, and in fact also took away their opportunity for direct representation, suggesting that Indians needed to be represented by white folk in parliament. Um, and so, because of this, um, Mandela became more interested also in the Indian experience and what was happening in India, um, which of course was a struggle against colonialism in and of its, of its own right. Um, and so together with the influences of Gower and the bus boycotts, um, all of these things began to shape Mandela's, if you like, development as a, as a, um, as a political being. Mandela, though, was beginning to read and beginning to look around and, 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 and in fact through exposure to Nehru, was also beginning to think about the dangers inherent in um, certainly extreme nationalism. Um, the independence of India, the lesson in that for Mandela that a mass movement that was organized could topple a huge power. This was a significant lesson um, and, and influence on, on um, Mandela. So he then became secretary of the African National Congress Youth League. He became responsible for setting up branches, for getting it to function organizationally. Um, and 
shortly after that, he then was promoted, if you like, to the National Executive Committee of the African National Congress itself for um, all this work that he had been doing. So he rose quite quickly at a young age through the Youth League, which he helped form, into the ANC. Now we get to a year which is probably as important as the 1976 point that I mentioned, and that is 1948. And I'm sure I might have mentioned this in a previous lecture. 1948 is when the Afrikaner, the Afrikaner government, the National Party, came into power under, uh, under the leadership of a person with the name of D.F. Malan. Um, I had a, a pause because I'm wondering if I should show this little, this little clip which um, describes a little, so it's not really even a film, it's just some words um, that might give you a sense of, of Milan and the Afrikaner and, and, and what, they, what they were like and, and what, what, what they represented when they came to power. They, remember, had been oppressed by the British. They were a conquered people at the turn of, so 1899 to 1901. Yeah? And in the, in, the, in the decades after that, they exhibited all the characteristics of a conquered people, including their own sense of inferiority, including their own sense of challenge around the fact that English was spoken in all the main cities and the British were trying to anglicize the country and that they couldn't cope with that language, they couldn't compete for jobs in the cities, um, and that they had been kept in these concentration camps, and that they were vanquished, they were conquered. So they had all those characteristics in this time up to 1948 when they came into power. And they, during this time, succeeded in forging their own strong brand of nationalism powerful brand of nationalism. A nationalism that was forged out of the crucible of this, of this conquered psychology, out of this conquered nature of, of a people, and which was forged around key ingredients, including religion. They had their own religion their own epic stories, their own heroes, um, and these ongoing grievances which they nursed against the British. If I talk about the strength of this nationalism, then allow me to tell you when my birthday is, which is on the 16th of December um, every year, um, <laughs> as long as I'm alive. Um, um, and I say that not in the hope that you remember my birthday, because of course I, I don't, I don't. I used to be embarrassed about my, my birthday. And now I'm really proud that my birthday falls on that day. That day always was a, was a, was a holiday, a public holiday in South Africa. And, and, and when, I was, when I was not proud of it, it was because it, it was known as Dingaan's Day. The name Dingaan might ring a bell with some folk. He was a Zulu, he was a, a Zulu king. And so um, it was known as Dingaan's Day or uh, the, bat, the day of the Battle of Blood River. And so as the Afrikaner left Cape Town because the British were taking it over, they, they trekked ever fur, further northwards. And on their way, as they went upwards, they encountered the Tosa folk and then the Zulu folk and these were particularly bloody skirmishes and battles that were fought. And, and I only know this date because it was on my birthday, so it resonated with me as a schoolboy when I was forced to learn a lot of one-sided history. Um, <laughs> on the 16th of December, 1838, the Boers fought a particularly bloody battle. And if you hear their stories, they will tell you that it was hundreds of thousands of Zulus, and in fact it was thousands perhaps, um, that they had fought on this day and had somehow managed to beat. Of course they had muskets and they formed a lager, and of course the Zulus had 
spears, etc. Um, nonetheless, they won that battle. On that day, they formed a covenant with God. And they said that because God had delivered them from the black danger, from this massive black danger, they were the chosen people and they were chosen to be dominant in that country and to settle that country and that this was their God-given land. Now, lest you think that this nationalism that I'm talking about and this description is, is, is hyperbole and, and that I might be, I might be, um, I would invite you to go to Pretoria in South Africa. And if you go into Pretoria, for those of you who've done it, you may, you may recognize this. You see two things. And the one thing you see long before you see the other thing. And the, and, the, and the one thing is, of course, the University of South Africa as you come on in. And the other thing is a thing that is known as the Voortrekker Monument. Have you heard? Have you seen this thing? You've seen the thing? It's not small. No. <laughs> it's not small. It's a huge thing. And so in that is, of course, the history, this history that I'm talking about, this religion, this epic, this epic struggle, all of it, that's right, absolutely. It's all put out along the sides and you can follow it almost chronologically and you can see the, the battles and so forth. And so you have the Afrikaner heroes in there, um, etc. And on the 16th of December, every year on my birthday, a shaft of light shines through a very cleverly constructed hole in the ceiling and, uh, and lights up this commemorative plaque of the, of the, the Battle of, of Blood River on that day. So, so what I'm trying to describe is, is, is perhaps the confluence, the emergence of two nationalisms. Can you see that? Is that beginning to emerge? On the one hand, you have this African national, black consciousness type nationalism emerging. And on the other, you have this Afrikaner, Boer nationalism emerging. And, and of course, this nationalism of the Afrikaner enables them to sweep up the white electorate around the two threats of communism and, and black numbers and gain electoral victory. And so you have the 1948 watershed, which is when the Afrikaner, with this nationalism, comes into power. And so this, I don't know, is it possible to dim those lights at the back, perhaps? Um. <coughs> this is Milan. That's, that's the first apartheid prime minister. Um, And he was prime minister from 48 to 54. And playing in the background is the apartheid national anthem, um, which I used to be able to sing and now can't anymore. Um, and that in Afrikaans says what Milan used to say is believe in your God, believe in your people and believe in yourself. And these are images from that time. And then when he asks the question, where to for the Afrikaner at that time? It's, he's saying, back to your God, back to your church, and back to your people. On your right, you have the person who no, on your left, you have the person who perfected apartheid. His name was Hendrik French Verwoerd. We will talk about him um, in the next lecture. And the one on the other side. He says, bring together what through faith belongs together. Or bring together, more precisely, what through inner conviction belongs together. And he says, just as little or just as impossible as it is for the eastern wind uh, uh, to stop the eastern wind with a sieve,
just as impossible as it is to stop the waves of the sea with a, with a broom. So you won't stop nationalism. These are his words, not, not necessarily mine. Huh? These are the lines. So you will not stop the surge of nationalism. That's the old South African flag. Um, and I could digress here into the Committee on National Symbols that we had during the transition and talk about how we um, emerged with the wonderful symbols we have today. Um, but that was the, the, old, the old South African flag. Um, um, and I do want to just get rid of it, if you don't mind. Um, actually, let me put those lovely lyrics back. They were much better. Um, right. So that gives you a sense, I think, I, think that I hope that gives you a sense of the, of, the, of the kind of nationalism we're, yes, sir, talking about. That's a great question. That's a fantastic question. It's a question I'm going to spend some time talking about in the next lecture when Mandela and others go on a tour of Africa and head over to the Soviet Union and search for, for funding for the, for the struggle against apartheid. So in some respects, I'm answering your question by saying they went on huge fundraising campaigns to, to secure funding in particular from the Soviets. Um, and, and running ahead of myself, when the Soviet Union was dissolved, one of the factors that led to the transition to democracy, and there were a number of them, but one of the most profound ones was the drying up of funds because of the disintegration of the Soviet Union, which was a huge funder, not just of the African National Congress, but other struggles across the globe, um, including the war, which I was most unfortunately part of, on the Namibian border with, with, in, with, Ang with Angola, so with Cubans and Russians in Angola, where, where the Soviet Union was putting in MiG fighter jets and tanks, T-34 tanks, and so forth. Um, so a lot of that funding, a lot of that funding came from sources, so African sources and, and uh, uh, Soviet sources. Um, but was never ad adequate e even. Um, in many senses. Um, the other thing Milan said, and I've been trying to search for this on, 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 on the computer, but haven't been able to find it, is that he said that um, for the first time, South Africa now belongs to us. And of course, he meant the Boer, the Afrikaner. When he came into power in his inaugural speech, he was saying, this country is ours for the first time. Now we can do in this country what we believe is, is right with this, what I then describe as toxic, but certainly with this, with this mix, this admixture of, 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 Africana, of Africana nationalism. Now, at this, at this time, so from 48 onwards, the context that I described, this, 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 this sticky uh, chewing gum, um, really comes into effect. So on the one hand, you have Milan and the new Afrikaner uh, government beginning now to apply statutory apartheid and beginning to develop a bureaucracy capable of implementing all those laws and a military machine capable of exerting force to ensure that the bureaucracy and the laws were, were upheld. At this time, and for a while, Mandela remained a staunch African nationalist. He genuinely believed the only way forward was for black people to fight this struggle and, struggle and to eschew any form of, of support um, um, from, any, from any other quarters. Um, <clears throat> and Mandela continued his struggle against the leadership the, the ineffective leadership of the African National Congress. In fact, if you look on page 57, for those of you who might have glanced at some of the pages in this book, Mandela had developed 
or was developing what he called a program of action. And the quote from him was that the ANC should now no longer merely rely on a change of heart on the part of the authorities. It needed to exert pressure in order to compel the authorities to grant its demands. And the more Mandela spoke about this emerging program of action from the Youth League, the more people were beginning to get excited, especially because, in the words of Samson, at last there was to be, to be action. Um, now, in the 50s, Soweto was a, 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 a lively place. It was a buzzing, a buzzing place. At the end of the last lecture, I had the privilege to speak to a gentleman here who spoke about jazz. And I think some of you are in, in a class on, on jazz. Um, and of course, for South Africans, black South Africans, in what was known as the shabines, the bars in the townships, jazz played a huge role in relation to bringing people together, um, keeping people um, happy. Um, um, as a, so, so shabines as a place of, of relaxation, as a place of coming together, um, hugely important. But what was happening was you had this buzzing um, Soweto, which up to 48 wasn't subject to any statutory apartheid, and so had in some of its areas also wonderfully mixed um, settlements. You had life going on there, and a lot of black folk not really realizing that this draconian legislation had emerged and was now beginning to squeeze them in a way that they had not been squeezed. I mean, it had been pretty dire up to that point, but not as dire as it was going to become. Mandela, at this point, was moving around Orlando West, which is a slightly more affluent part of, of Soweto. Um, he loved music. He loved dancing, as you saw. Um, he had lots of close relationships, amongst others, also with local musicians. He had a car. He was earning money as a lawyer. He had money, as you saw in the film, for those of you who saw the film on Mandela. He enjoyed eating out. He loved his tailored suits. Um, so he had a slightly different lifestyle as well as the average person um, in the township. Just to remind ourselves, Samson notes that despite all of this, he still had that aristocratic demeanor and that sort of removed look in his eye, um, which was something that stayed with him. But uh, Samson says that his, that his famous smile, his presence and his charm helped to counter, helped to counter that. Um, Mandela generally, though, did avoid the shabines. He didn't necessarily always like to hang out in those shabines because he was a person who liked to keep fit. He was a boxer. And so he liked to get up early in the mornings, liked to stay in shape. And he liked the fact that boxers were role models for black South Africans at, the, at that time. He oftentimes saw politics in boxing terms, certainly in those days, and would um, talk about, as, as I quote from page 61, as politics being essentially, um, a, 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 sorry, as boxing being a context which was essentially egalitarian and colorblind, a place where Africans could triumph over discrimination. But in any event, politics, as I say, had taken over his life, and, um, and Mandela was keen to respond to the call. Grassroots organizing was woefully adequate despite his best attempts, and the ANC still remained, it lacked finances, and the ANC still remained wary of collaboration with the so-called other races. At this time, the government, so in the, in the early 50s, um, had responded to something which I think was happening in your country as well. And so the Communist Party in South Africa was banned. <clears throat> and because of this ban of the Communist Party, it brought whites, white folk in the Communist Party closer to the, to the ANC. And of course, I refer to McCarthyism, which was a phenomenon in, in, in America, I think, around, around that time. And so together with the banned um, Communist Party, the African National Congress, because of this ban, 
launched a campaign against um, this, this, this uh, uh, draconian oppression of free speech. But Mandela was militantly anti-communist. And so even as the Communist Party was holding rallies, say in a room like this with folk like yourselves and talking about how they would campaign against this, this banning of theirs, what did Mandela do? Well, I mean, you know, I guess hate is a strong word, but he disliked communists. He would come up here, he would probably bang me against the head and shove me away from the podium. He was not afraid of being physical. He would heckle from there. And if the heckling didn't end the thing, he would physically get up and go and end the thing himself. That was Mandela. If you look on page 62, you will see that Mandela was, I quote, a heckler and a disruptor in chief of the Youth League. He was at the vanguard of that disruption. He was the first to get in there and his, his abilities. So, so as, as, as Samson re recognizes, Mandela could be a rough agitator. In 1950, Mandela was elected president of the African National Congress Youth League. And at that point in 50, was still arguing that black South Africans needed to go it alone. But in private, he was gently beginning to change his views. Mandela didn't regard himself as an intellectual, but he did read voraciously. He was impressed by the support of the Soviet Union for liberation movements across the globe at that time. He did find Marxist dialectical materialism compelling. And um, you may recall that he was schooled in Klunu in a, in a mission school and had a Christian education there um, because part of the idea was for missionaries was to bring um, Christianity to the heathens, if you like. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, he, he felt a little bit of regret at abandoning some of his, some of his Christian beliefs, but the, his biographer notes that he never, had a strong, he never had a strong Christian belief, including during his time on Robben Island and in two other jails. For those of you who go on the tour at Robben Island, some of those tour guides are naughty. They often ask you a question about, you know, how long was Mandela locked up on this island and, and people will say 27 years. Don't say 27 years. He was only there for 18 of his 27 years. Um, he's, he languished in three different jails. Um, and we might talk about, in fact, it gets ever so interesting. I don't have enough time. <laughs> because it gets ever so interesting when we get to his third jail and we get to these secret talks that were occurring that still remain a secret to us South Africans and it's something where there's a, there's a dearth of research. There isn't enough research on what was going on in those secret negotiations. Um, and if we have time, I might demonstrate at least five or six strands of secret discussions that I have unearthed and, and found, some more publicly known than others. So one of those that's very publicly known and I refer to here is the fact that his, his last jail <coughs> Victor Fester was bugged by the National Intelligence Services and they had started having discussions with Mandela about post-apartheid South Africa. That was one process. The other process is captured very well in a film called Endgame. If any of you want to see that film, it really does describe the role of Anglo-American and um, capital in, in relation to paving the way for the transition with the African National Congress leaders, um, Thabo Mbeki and others in London. They, they had a few meetings in London. And so there were these secret discussions going on. And part of, the, part of the National Party's idea of moving Mandela was so that they could soften him up in this wonderful three-bedroomed house with a beautiful view of the mountains, the Drakenstein Mountains. Um, and bug the place and hear what he was saying and then go and meet him, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if I had time to uh, talk about all of that as well, I don't know. Um, but he, so Mandela was not a saint. Mandela would never have a strong religious faith. And Mandela himself, as we have noted from the beginning of this, of this series, um, himself said he was no saint.
when, so when Mandela, I think I still have 10 minutes, is that okay? 10 or 12 minutes or something like that, yeah? Anyone have a question? Uh, you know, I do, I do. Let's do Q&A, let's do some Q&A. So I'll go here and then there. Yes, ma'am. Could you explain a little more detail who the Africanos were? Yes. So, so, the so, I, so the question is, could I explain in a little more detail who the Afrikaners were? And I guess still are, because they still are um, um, there. So they um, are of Dutch descent. They arrived with, the, with Jan van Riebeek in 1652 and originally took over the Cape. Um, and then in a succession of challenges between themselves and the British, um, ultimately left the Cape um, um, in search of new, in, in search of new um, 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 geographic places to, to, to occupy. They had a distinct culture. So their, their culture and their religion, a Calvinist type religion, and a, a Dutch type, type culture, um, their, own, their own language, which was a form of of Dutch, which is known as Afrikaans, uh, which is really kitchen Dutch, as the way we describe it. Um, and, and so without going into like, so, so there's a lot to say about how the Afrikaner emerged and who they were and their identity and so forth, um, but emerged as a discrete group of folk who had this belief, as I was describing through the monument and other things, um, that they were a, a, a group of folk who needed to retain their characteristics, their language, their color, their religion, um, um, and, their, and their other beliefs, um, and who were always struggling for ownership of the country, and, and, and from whom ownership, if you like, was always being taken away, in particular by the British, and ultimately then in 48 came into power and could assert themselves as an Afrikaner people through the words of D.F. Malan um, and, 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 and put in place their program of action, which was essentially one of apartheid to um, bolster their position in, in South Africa. So that really is sort of who the Afrikaner, who the Afrikaner was. There was a question at the back and then I'll come to you and I, um, I don't know if I, and then I'll, I'll come over there. So, yes, sir. And, and so now I know that I need to adjust what I've said so that I'm clearer. Um, um, Welsh, there's a book by Welsh, Professor Welsh, called The, uh, called, called the Rise and Fall of Apartheid, which helps a lot if, if for, the, for those folk who want to read more. Um, it's, there's an excellent description of, of the Afrikaner. There's also one by an Afrikaner professor called um, Herman Giliumir, Gilio Me is probably how you would pronounce his name here. It's called the Afrikaner and it's about that thick. <laughs> I say that so I put you off reading <laughs> it. <laughs> um, yes, sir. Was the Afrikaner colonial or was there a purpose of the colonial settlement where they moved natural resources out <coughs> and the British wanted those natural resources? Is that what the war was about. So, so, so this is another of those contradictions that South Africa is famous for. So the Afrikaner was both colonial and anti-colonial. So originally the Afrikaner was colonial. The Afrikaner came from Holland. So they came on down south, saw the strategic importance in the context of the Dutch East India Company for trade with the East and wanted to establish a presence where they could plant uh, 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 plants and, and get water and so forth, because it was a long journey to the east. They then settled, and and so the struggle then became anti-colonial for the for the for the for the Afrikaner. And in fact, some of the Afrikaners will often go on record as saying, "We were the first freedom fighters in this country because we fought the British." And so. <laughs> So they were both colonial and anti-colonial because once they had established themselves and saw that as their home, they did not like the idea of the British taking the resources back out of the country. They, they then wanted to keep the resources, but wanted to keep the resources for themselves, not for black, white, colored, and, and, and Indian South Africans as a whole. 
So they were originally colonial, but then as they established their roots and recognized that they wanted to be a pat particular group of people with a particular cultural identity, which they felt very strongly about, they then became anti-colonial. I'm going to go there, and then here, and here. So, sorry. Uh, he went to law school first at Fort Hare, which is a, which was a black university. So it was a university established solely for black folk, and he tried to start law there, um, but he got in trouble there because of certain things that were happening in the in the kitchens, the canteens, and access to food and so forth. He stood up for certain groups of folk and got expelled. He went up to um, a university known as Witz, the University of Witwatersrand, and he got special permission as a black man to attend law school there. And he really struggled with law, um, not because he couldn't deal with the um, subject matter, but because he had to work in the day and study by night in the townships with this paraffin lamp and so forth. And in the book, you will, you, you know, you will read about his struggle with his studies, completed his, his law studies there, and then went into practice. So that, in effect, describes, in a nutshell, his training. Yes, very few. He was royal. There were exceptions, very few exceptions that were made. And for those few exceptions, it was not easy. There was a question here, then here, and then there. So, and I'm going to try and keep track. So sorry if I, so yes, sir. Where did the Boer War fit into all this? Yeah, so the Boer War was 1899 to 1901. And the Boer War <coughs> was the thing that, that um, hurt, the, it was the cherry on top of the cake in terms of the pain the Afrikaner felt in relation to uh, British domination. And so the development of this particular nationalism that I was describing, it was born from the experiences that emerged from the Anglo-Boer War at that time. So the fact that the Afrikaner was a conquered people uh, uh, demonstrating the psychosis of, an, of a conquered people, including lack of self-esteem, um, um, no access to resources, that they were a defeated people, this played in strongly to the development of this particular type of nationalism, which then ascended and came into power in 1948. So you can see the Boer War um, and the anti-colonialism dilemma emerging strongly from um, the end of the, of the Anglo-Boer War. So the, 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 the British came in and, de and defeated the Afrikaner in the Boer War. Yes. They, the British took over at that time. And multiple other times there have been skirmishes prior to that. Um, and then ultimately led to the British giving South Africa to South Africans, white South Africans, in the Union in 1910, saying, well, you know, the Crown will withdraw itself, we'll set up a whites-only parliament, which was that union that I, that I spoke about, and the fact that the African National Congress then was formed, as they'd hoped black folk would be included in that union and weren't, so their hopes, their hopes were dashed. There was a question here. I don't know the figures offhand, but they, they were hugely um, so blacks formed and continue to form a vast majority in relation to um, the numbers of, of whites. And so that question of numbers um, was always an important thing. Um, white folk felt, for right or wrong, felt hugely afraid of these big numbers. And in fact, these population projections were something that was a, was a bit of an obsession with the National Party, the Afrikaner. And they had, I think, in their population projections, um, um, constantly predicted and tried everything they could to 
unbalanced those numbers, but predicted that that number would always um, be at a so so would always place them as a as an increasingly small um, minority. Um, I, I think there was a question there, and then I'm going to come here. Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the Indian population, how and why, is, how, how they end up in, in South Africa? Yeah, yeah. So, so the so so if you go to the east coast of northeast coast of South Africa, it's warm, it's humid, it's subtropical, it's a wonderful place to grow sugar. Um, and of course, if you are a white landowner, you may not necessarily want to work in the plantations yourself. Um, and because you 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 um, had access to slaves and others um, in the east. You might then want to sort of bring these folk in to work on, on these plantations. And so a lot of Indian folk were brought in to work on the sugar plantations around what we then can see as, as the Durban sort of area today, um, which is a wonderfully lush area. Um, and, and, and so the idea was to bring these folk in, let them work on those, on those lands. Um, and of course they then, <laughs> Increased in number, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. In a nutshell, there is a question here. Um, just about the Indian thing too. Yeah. Um, so uh, Mandela and the others were uh, were interested in what was going on in India in terms of the anti-colonial yes. challenge and so forth. What about Gandhi's non-violent um, philosophy? How, how much? How does she feel about that? Or how does <laughs> I continue with my lecture by way of answer to your question. I do not wish to discourage other questions, and I shall simply quickly answer oops, sorry, that question by saying the Indian influence was strong, but there was much argument, certainly also in Mandela's mind, about the nature of that influence and about the nature of the influence of Mahatma Gandhi and his, his idea of Satyagraha, the passive resistance type um, approach that he took. Mandela did not share Gandhi's purest view. This is, this is classic Mandela. Mandela is this, the strategist, Mandela the tactician. Mandela says on page 68, I, I, I saw nonviolence on the Gandhian model, not as an inviolable principle but as a tactic to be used as the situation demanded. That literally sums up what he took from Gandhi. Um, and so he was certainly ready to deploy Gandhian tactics when he felt they were needed. But, they were, but, that, but that was by no means going to limit him as it might have others in relation to a range of responses a collection of responses and, 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 and refining and developing and perfecting a range of responses and not just the pure, um, <clears throat> the pure Gandhian stuff. And so he, Mandela knew that mass action and, and, and in fact this defiance campaign that the Youth League under his leadership had begun to engage in, he knew that this would head in two directions. And those directions were, on the one hand, that the black South African resistance movements would begin to develop and perfect forms of re resisting the state, including, but not limited to, the Gandhian model. But he also knew that it would come at a significant cost to his people in terms of the brutal response that he expected from the state. And so he knew that whether he adopted the Gandhian model, and he wasn't only going to do that, whether he adopted other models, including bus boycotts and things, there was going to be um, harsher confrontation. Um, I, 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 so, 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 so Mandela at that time joined a small committee that had decided to write a letter to that Milan. Um, and the letter was a, was, a, was, a, was a demand to repeal six unjust laws. 
And so on page 69, you see that um, Samson refers to this letter being received by the Prime Minister's secretary. And the Prime Minister's secretary responding to Mandela saying, the differences between the races are permanent. They are not man-made. And these new laws that you classify and regard as oppressive are not oppressive and degrading. They are protective and therefore they should stay in place. The committee with Mandela reiterated its demand um, and then said that if these demands were not met, there would be a campaign, the defiance campaign. And I think I'm going to end here um, because I th have I run out of time? I think I have. I'll take a last question. Last question. You painted a great picture of him as a young adult and as a dog of Middle I have no idea of what he was like as a young man or as a child. Tell me something about his family. <laughs> So if you want to know about his child, I specifically childhood, I said I was going to avoid talking about his childhood and that I wasn't going to get into that. If there's an appetite in this room for me to do that, then I shall do my next lecture on Mandela's childhood. Is that something you want? I don't want to hold a lecture. I just want to put my hands around it. Okay. I shall spend 10 minutes in the next lecture talking about the first two or three chapters of this book by way of answer to that question. And then we shall continue with the defiance campaign and some of the bigger factors that challenged Mandela, including forced removals and other things, which we get to in next Wednesday's lecture. So don't leave feeling dissatisfied. I shall do something brief on his childhood. Um, thank you so much. Thank you.